Okay, so welcome to the long deferred and delayed and rescheduled uh, inaugural call for phase four open active W3C community group. Um, the topic for the call is going to be memberships. Um, and this is um, very much an inaugural call. I think this is likely to be a complex topic. Uh, I hope to be proved wrong. Um, but I suspect what will fall out from this is a, a, an agenda for further calls in the future, looking at, at smaller parts of this. Uh, so the purpose of this call really is to make sure that we're all aligned on our understanding of what the requirements for memberships are, and that we've got a roughly similar conception of what memberships is going to involve and what's in scope and out of scope um, for the rest of 2021, really. Um, so the conversation today will be mostly about requirements. It should be mostly uh, limited in its technical involvement, uh, which we're trying to keep things fairly high level. Um, but before we start off down that path, if I could just go around and ask everyone to introduce themselves. I'll start. Uh, I'm Timothy Hill of the uh, Open Data Institute. Um, and I've been uh, facilitating these meetings. Um, and then I'll move to Rob Redpath. Cool. So I'm Rob Bedpath. I'm part of Open Data Services Co-op. Um, we're currently doing some work to uh, help the Open Active Initiative with its governance, um, and so I'm here as, as part of that. Um, should I pass on to uh, Stephen, who's now after me on my screen? Sounds good. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Stephen Winfield from GLL, Digital Services Manager. And for me, uh, Martin. Uh, hello, uh, Martin Alvarez. Uh, I'm the I'm uh, part of the uh, European Huawei team uh, in charge of some standardization activities. But uh, I'm here following your activities from the distance because I'm the chair of the Open Track uh, Community Group, which is uh, now we we call it Open Athletics to avoid any any misunderstanding of the name. Uh, so we have some uh, perhaps some overlaps. Uh, in the future, because we are standardizing athletics. Oh, very interesting. OK, I'm sure we can pick up after this call as well. Thank you. Um, Anne-Marie. Hi, I'm Marie Eric, um, MCR Active Digital Lead. I'm bouncing on for a presentation in a bit, so uh, you'll hear a bit more about what I do in that. And Alice. Hi everyone, Alice John. I'm a senior consultant at Four Global. I work um, on behalf of the supplier team um, in Manchester, um, working alongside Anne Marie on the, the MCR Active project. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew Marshall, please. Yeah, Andrew Marshall, so I'm the principal architect at Gladstone, um, but I also uh, manage the Everyone Active account. And uh... Claire Rollins, please. Also with Gladstone, so I'm managing director. So as Andrew says, twofold interest, really the, you know, the overarching standard, but equally supporting everyone active in the work that they're doing in this space at the moment. Uh, Matthew. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a developer for sports. We provide league and venue management software to a number of customers around the UK. Uh, recently completed an implementation of the Open Booking API um, and uh, yeah, interested in the membership side of things because we've got some requirements around that for an integration with MCR Active. And uh, as you can tell, I'm losing my voice. So I won't hopefully be talking much on this call. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Uh, Wayne. Yep, uh, I am. I'm Wayne Granger. I am the product owner for Legends by Explorer. Thank you. Uh, Laura Quayle. Uh, hi, I'm Laura. I'm a relationship officer for Insight at Active Westminster. Um, I've been involved uh, with Eugene Minogue for sort of implementing uh, open active standards uh, within Westminster. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Nathan. Uh, hi, I'm Nathan. I'm the lead developer at Playfinder slash BookTech. Um, we've got a couple of open active integrations. Cool. Uh, Donald Smith. Hi, I'm uh, head of IT at uh, We Play Football. Um, we are uh, provide booking services to uh, some of GLL's 
uh, clients for their uh, all weather pitches and we have a, an active development for MCR active as well so thank you uh, Nick Evans hello Nick Evans from I'm in doing lots of things with open active uh, yeah interested in membership <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll throw in there that Nick was also principal author of most of our specifications, uh, including the booking spec. So, yeah, the involvement is fairly deep there, I would say, um, responsible for many of the documents we'll be looking at today. Um, ben Beavers. I am uh, Ben Beavers. I'm a Group Development Director for Everyone Active. And Izzy. Hi, Izzy Champion. I'm Data Innovation Manager at Sports England, and I'm the Relationship Manager for our work with the ODI and ODSC, actually, separately, um, but our work on Open Active as a whole. Uh, Jason. Uh, hi, all. Nice to see so many faces on the, on the call today. Uh, Jason, Consultant for the Open Data Institute, uh, working on engagement for Open Active. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Debbie Giordano. Um, everyone active, um, IT applications team. And uh, finally, Nish. Nish put a comment on the side saying he's very, he's in a very noisy space. Oh, okay. Um, but he has, he has introduced himself on the side. Oh, okay, great. So yeah, for context, uh, yeah, Nish is also with, with I'm in, uh, which Nick Evans also represents. Um, okay, thank you all for, for joining the call. Um, as I say, uh, the topic is memberships. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen here. Um, da -da. And there's a very broad agenda. Um, Broadly speaking, first of all, I'll just take you through a broad overview of the background here. Um, uh, after I've done the, the background introduction, um, to make sure we're aligned on requirements, uh, I'll ask people from MCR Active, uh, particularly Anne-Marie, to give a, an overview of MCR Active requirements, and then we'll make sure that everyone is in agreement that those requirements are broadly representative across the sector. And I'm aware that Anne-Marie has to drop off the call fairly soon. Um, so I'll just quickly say that in background, um, the membership proposal was largely developed in response to MCR Active and Active Westminster, uh, those initiatives and their needs. Um, however, uh, it seemed to quickly grow more complex than, than previously envisaged. Uh, this started off as a GitHub issue, uh, which became extremely long. Uh, I would invite anyone who's, who's new to the call to take a look at least at the start of that GitHub thread. Uh, which I think outlines the overall um, scope pretty well. Uh, but this has since evolved into a fairly lengthy Google Doc proposal for, for what membership schemes should look like in Open Active, uh, supporting MCR Active and Active Westminster. Um, and it's really turned into uh, three, I think it's fair to say, um, areas of, of focus. The first is customer account management. Um, with certain aspects of that excluded, but by and large managing customer accounts, uh, issuing barcodes to allow those customers to gain access to sports facilities uh, and leisure centers. And then finally, questions around pricing and in particular entitlements. So if people are entitled to particular discounts because they belong to particular demographics or live in a particular area or have a certain membership, how that pricing would work out. So those are the three broad areas that are addressed by the proposals linked to there. Um, so, broadly speaking, as I said, this is an inaugural call, so our first um, task is to make sure that we're meeting the right requirements, that all requirements are covered for people interested in the W3C specifications. Uh, we're also going to be tracking uh, trial implementations, looking at people who have implemented already and how they have looked at membership uh, potential difficulties down the road and addressing issues that might arise. Um, and then finally, once those issues have been hashed out, we'll be looking at ratifying and formalizing that in the standards themselves. And I would envisage this lasting until the end of the year. Ideally, it's actually all much simpler than I'm imagining, and this can all proceed more quickly. But mentally, I've got three months blocked out for this, and I, I suspect that, that the discussion will take us in that direction. But we'll see how we go. 
so for this call, uh, we've already covered off introductions. Um, and the next order of business is going to be to hand over to Anne-Marie for her to take us through MCR Active and their requirements. Um, so Anne-Marie is the digital strategic lead for MCR Active and so is uh, pretty well placed, I think, to take us through what that uh, ambitious project is doing right now. So over to you, Anne-Marie. Thanks. Okay, let me just try and see if I can bring up the presentation. Is everyone seeing presentation now? Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Tim said there, I'm digital lead for MCR Active, um, which is the sport and leisure uh, strategic arm for Manchester City Council. Um, uh, most of you, and I know most of you are aware of the, of the project that we're um, embarked on here in Manchester, but Tim just wanted me to give a quick overview um, for those that maybe weren't as, as um, aware of, of the different things that we're trying to uh, achieve through the digital transformation that we're, that we're currently undertaking. Um, to set the scene, the, the key challenges that we were trying to address was to create a one-stop shop in essence for residents to find um, physical activity, um, whether that was they knew what they were looking for um, in terms of a squash court, they could go to one place and view all the squash courts in the city, um, or if they were looking for inspiration, they'd be able to find that in, in a website that um, had robust and up-to-date information. And so we look at open data to facilitate that in the main. So we pull from both our leisure operators um, and from a number of NDBs. And we also um, built a provider portal that allows um, independent organizations in the city. And I'll bounce into these in a wee bit more. So this is just a quick screen grab of the site that we have got up and running. Um, you can see there that we have um, Activity Finder for residents to find their uh, activities in their local area. They can filter by age, by um, distance, um, obviously by activity. There's a whole range of filters in there. We've got Get Involved, which is different inspirational things, whether they want to volunteer in our sector or find walking groups, um, social walls, all the different things that we're doing as a service, um, and news and events is all the different sporting events that's coming to the city. So that's currently up and running, um, albeit we are making um, improvements to the site weekly. Um, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, something that you launch with very much looks very different 12, 18 months down the line. So it's definitely been a big learning curve these last 12 months in terms of that site and, and how it works, in particular the activity finder, um, especially when it comes to um, how to integrate with open data feeds, because it's not always how you would anticipate it. Um, again, another learning cave. Um, the provider portal that um, I quickly mentioned earlier, um, which facilitates um, independent organizations in Manchester to upload their activities and their events. Um, it's also all quality assurance, online digital journey for quality assurance. So um, instead of manually asking our partners to give us their public liability, their DBS, their safeguarding um, procedures, they upload all of that for us. And that's then checked by the um, provider officer who's in charge of that relationship. Um, and once they're um, all checked and if everything's okay, they're then allowed to upload their activities and they have one of these marks associated depending on the level that they've gone through for that quality assurance. So the supplier portal does two things for us. It obviously gives us a really robust quality assurance safeguarding procedure and um, moving away from the manual one that had issues uh, left, right and center with it. And also it grows our content on the site because whilst open data feeds are great, we all know that that's um, a journey that our sector's on. And so um, a lot of, of providers still don't have online platforms that maybe have the booking technology behind to facilitate the open data um, API. So the supplier portal allows us to have that content on the site and they obviously manage it. So it's instead of what again, you guys would have been aware of as well is traditionally you would have been sent a spreadsheet, tell me everything that's happening um, from your service in this area, you sent enter and it's out of date because that, that instructor has now changed the day or they're no longer getting funding for it. So the supplier portal allows that organization, that business to manage their own account, update the activities, cancel them, change the pricing on it um, and use it as a business tool really as well. Um, we've also built our central data repository um, I'm not going to go into too much because that's not what the focus of this is, but it allows us to pull our participation data into one place. 
and gives us a really good tool for insight and intelligence based decisions moving forward, as well as for reporting purposes to um, our own funders and boards. Coming soon, fingers crossed, eh, Nick? <laughs> um, we are looking to introduce onto the site um, our Book Now functionalities through open booking. So that will allow um, our resident to go, oh, great, there's a swimming session or a squash court. Um, I can see what price it is. I just want to book that. And uh, the, obviously, we are all aware of open booking. And fingers crossed, that'll be on the site in the next couple of months and allow our uh, users to quickly and efficiently book whatever activity they have found via the site. Um, we have, want to move away from any kind of physical token. So in our leisure centers currently, um, our pay and play is, um, has obviously physical cards associated to it. Um, the MCR Active app um, will allow us to obviously uh, uh, issue virtual um, physical token or membership cards or barcode really um, to our users um, as well as allow us to um, what I'm going to touch base on, on stuff that we're working on next year um, around geofencing and pushing of notifications so if the user has the app down and it's open we're able to obviously push notifications to say oh you're in the park you know park run happens here on a Saturday and also there just quickly a quick note to the user account allows the user to um, link up wearable technology and this is all to um, help us um, grow our understanding of uh, participation in the city rather than only having the formal um, data from um, activities we're, we're hoping to start to gain understanding of usage of our parks open spaces and independent activity levels within different demographics in Manchester. Uh, future, so as I mentioned there, we're looking to geofence some uh, parks and open spaces to start to understand what the usage is, who's using it, where we need to focus, and we are looking at um, incentivizing our scheme. So obviously, um, we'll touch base on the membership bits around concessions. So for us, the um, MCR Active scheme will, has two folds. As a, as a user, as a, if you have an account, you will get concessionary rates on certain activities, but we want to look at how we incentivize activity. Um, it's something that I think our sectors uh, never really um, got the answer for, and certainly I'm not saying that we will, but uh, we will look to, to introduce some pilots next year around that. Um, and just very, very, very quickly, um, our, we are just about to embark on with our um, health partners in the Manchester Local Care Organization and Public Health around um, having, once obviously what I just went through is all up and running and we're happy enough with it, is then moving to that next stage around frontline practitioners if they need to refer somebody to physical activity intervention, whether it's cardiac rehab, prehab for cancer, physical activity intervention services, there's a one-stop shop for them to do that. And that's from having quite a bit of um, uh, interaction and, and workshops with our colleagues over in, in the MLCO and public health around the challenges that they face um, when referring. And obviously we all know that um, social prescribing is a big agenda and so this is the solution that we're looking at in Manchester for how we really kind of address that so just a quick nod to that because I am conscious of times and um, so why we're here today and um, obviously as part of um, what we're trying to achieve and um, we are looking at membership integration to facilitate um, a lot of the functionalities that I just touched base on and um, I'm not going to go into the, any of the technical bits I know Nick's on the call and can pick that up and along with Tim but I just wanted to kind of give a quick overview as to why Manchester is um, uh, using this approach and, and really kind of um, championing it. And um, for us, the membership integration um, facilitates quite a number of the challenges that we were trying to overcome. So one of the biggest issues that we had in Manchester, and, and I'm sure a lot of this is across other local authorities, is residents would have to give us their information over and over and over again. So it, we were so poor at it, we would get them to sign up to potentially two leisure operators to access this, um, all the swimming pools in the city. But equally, if they wanted to go to our holiday camp that we were running in the park, they'd have to give us their information again. If they wanted to go to the uh, Tots on the Move session that we were running in the local church, give it to us again. Because we, we all had these little um, schemes and silos with all our own different registration formats and, and things. But it was all the same information. It was all those kind of key five, name, address, date of birth, gender, ethnicity, maybe a few others depending on the funding stream. So the membership integration allows a, a resident to just give us that information once and from there they can decide who they want to share that with in terms of what activity they want to 
access. It's all at the touch of buttons. It's not having to give it to us again, fill out forms left, right and centre. Um, so for me, that was one of the key things with the membership integration um, standards that uh, Nick will, or Tim will go through. And it also allows them to manage from one account. Because we all hate it. We all have a million apps on our phones. And what we don't want is a resident having to sign into multiple accounts just to be able to book physical activity in their area. They should be able to manage that from one account and book with those relevant providers, especially ones that we directly have control over um, as a council. Um, so that was a big key one for us. Um, another one is we really are keen for families to be able to register and manage an account. So mom or dad or both can book their kids and manage their activities and see the activities of the family. Um, it allows us to obviously um, apply um, concessions and for that user to see what concessions that their eligibility um, allows them to have. And a big one for me was it future proofs the scheme. So we, we've been looking at how we were going to facilitate uh, the functions that I touched base on earlier um, for quite a while now. And what we didn't want to do was build something very bespoke between us and our um, leisure operators that we have in the city today, everyone active in GLL, um, because that in no way kind of future proofs or allows us to kind of grow the scheme. So if we brought another provider on board, how and they, they said to, to allow booking or to be recognized in our site, um, you, we need that, that data passed across. But if we had built, we were looking at widgets and things like that, that were very bespoke to the two systems that we were currently dealing with, that wouldn't have allowed us any kind of scalability of our scheme or, like I said, future proofing. Um, no offense, Ben and Stephen, but if another leisure operator came into this into the city, so it, it really kind of, you know, it's now, it's been now, have the hard work now, and it future proofs us um, for, for down the line. So, that in a nutshell, nutshell for us was um, what are we trying to achieve in Manchester? How have we gone about getting what we've got up and running? What's coming down the line? And why we have really kind of embraced, I suppose, this membership integration um, method with in, right now with both of our leisure operators. That is who we are integrating our memberships with. Um, but as I said, down the line, I don't know who knows, but right now that's our focus is to, to have that um ability with everyone active in jll so that they too can be recognized a resident can be recognized in their site and th those operators also have the data and um, that they have today tomorrow when we when we go live with this scheme so i have some questions <laughs> or if anyone has questions i have another 10 minutes if you need tim <laughs> i will stop sharing as well so one second Yeah, so is it, does anyone have any questions really, I guess is the, the next point. <laughs> I feel like that was a lot. <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry. I always feel like when I'm given short times, I throw up on people around the project. Um, so happy to have any questions emailed to me and then feel free to share my um, contact details or there might not be any. Uh, also happy with that. <laughs> well, I think I think in the first instance, then maybe um, because uh, Nick has kindly prepared a document which I think breaks down uh, the immediate requirements in that very ambitious vision, and we can go through those point by point and validate those, that with people on the call. Um, but if it's not too much of an imposition, um, I'm going to look at Laura um, and ask her if. Active Westminster broadly aligns with that presentation. Would you, where, where are the points where Active Westminster aligns with that vision and where are the points where the focus is a bit different? Um, um, I mean, we pretty much align. Um, we have had sort of a few conversations with Manchester Active um, trying to get a similar approach. Um, so sort of sharing resources and, and sort of coming together to, to for sort of the common goal. So, um, yeah sort of aligned i'd say okay right so there's a there's a strong convergence there then okay uh ben sorry you've raised your hand yeah um i'm obviously coming to this a little bit late um in in terms of sort of uh in in terms of the ambition and stuff but i mean we've got uh tens of thousands of different types of memberships and all of those vary on hours of access 
of people being able to access a facility, different facilities that they can get a discount on, and other ones they can't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm, I'm, and maybe this is what we're coming to with with Nick. Is that part of what's been sort of you know spec through in terms of how that's how that's sort of picked up and adopted? I'm assuming it is, but. Um, so off the top of my head, and Nick can correct me here. So the, the requirement that there be differential pricing available depending on membership, that's already well covered, although there's a variety of strategies for how you answer that. Did you mention restricted access for hours, though? Well, sorry, it might be helpful to just, just clarify a bit of terminology here, because I think when we say membership in the sector, it can be quite ambiguous as to what we're talking about. Um, specifically here, we're not talking about pay monthly. Uh, we're talking about the kind of membership that you get membership in inverted commas that you get uh, when you join a, a scheme such as MCR Active or Active Westminster, which, which gives you a discount of say 15% um, as, a, as a pay and play member. Um, so the, the, the scope is not here anything to do with actually um, joining provision of memberships for, for direct debit, anything like that. Um, this is just about um, those, those membership schemes and also allowing people who have already got a membership, whatever that membership might be, unspecified to make bookings using the membership through MCR Active or other. So that that helps. So that we've been using the term entitlements, which I think Eugene um, uh, coined uh, previously as a, as a kind of way of saying it. an entitlement is not a membership as a direct deb deb debit membership is kind of inferred, but an entitlement is more we're entitled to a discount if we if we uh, meet certain criteria with the council or other. I think it's an important element of the scope that, of what isn't included, because I think, you know, um, I, I mean, I can think of hundreds of sort of off big memberships or you get a discount off this activity, but not off that one. And you get that one on a Thursday if you, you know, if you turn up with three kids in a, you know, uh, so, so it's just about if, if it's just purely headline rate and a, and a discount off and that's all we're doing, then, then that's sort of, for me, it's an important element of scope that we need to be really clear with everybody that that's that, that that's where this this lies uh because because there are quite a lot of complexities as i'm sure gll find as well um yeah sorry just to just to pick up on that so i mean there is a question of yes the the alignment between membership in the sense of the mcr active umbrella scheme and membership of particular institutions participating in that scheme um so the question of restricted access actually does seem to be relevant, that um, if the participating institution is publishing um, data which actually isn't available to everybody because they might have a restricted institutional membership, uh, that does seem to be a requirement that does need to be catered for, that isn't catered for right now. Isn't, isn't that correct, Nick? Uh, you're, yeah, actually. So the, um, the requirement is catered for in the proposal, but it's not in the high level requirements list. So, right, so okay. that, is, that is a good, because, and this is because Wayne specifically figured that out on the last call we had on this in 2019, that that was a gap. Um, citing you there, Wayne, as uh, noting that that, that so, uh, and then therefore it was incorporated into the proposal from that uh, kind of recognition there was a gap there, but, but you're hundred percent right. That's not in the top line requirements that we've mm -hmm. been talking about. Okay. Just sorry, is that just so I'm clear? Um, that's about restriction that you can't book into a certain activity because you haven't got a, I don't know, a gym induction. Is that is, is that kind of is that is that what we're talking about, or is that all? There's there's two different types of thing. Yeah, there's there's exactly. In fact, I actually know it's the same. It's the same uh, solution to I guess multiple problems, which is. Um, what are what are the kind of free text? That's the way it's currently solved. I and mean, jumping to solution, but the uh, how would you describe the limit, the, the restrictions on a specific activity, and um, and something that um, actually I know Debbie might already have a, a view on this because I think this is something that was added to OWS. Uh, Debbie, the the kind of adding a restriction, you can you can put free text in there, uh, and we in the examples we've used uh, from Wayne's previous other, um, comment, it's things like you know you need a gold membership to book the session or as you say you need a gym induction to book the session um but that's the text it doesn't it doesn't it's not clever enough to link through to click here and get your gym induction or click here and get a gold membership 
um, the assumption is that you can navigate to find out whatever that is through through other means. Um, it didn't attempt to kind of address those pathways at, at where it is at the moment. Could, it could do, but it, it doesn't currently do that. Okay, but yeah, I feel like moving to the solution has turned two requirements into one requirement, which, which is you know arguably correct. But so that's two different restrictions, one of which it might be something like peak hours versus off peak, and the other one would be some sort of prerequisite having been fulfilled, right? Um, okay, and I, I don't think that's ex exhaustive list, though, from what I understand from uh, conversations with Gladstone. I think there's quite a few different restrictions you can add to a membership. Right, I, okay. I might be wrong. I don't. So I don't. If we if we start enumerating that that detail, it might it there's probably a lot in there as well. I don't know. Okay, that's interesting though, because yeah, because it's not in the high level requirements document, there's, <laughs> it's hard to surface that sort of um, um, in the running order. Um, so I think we'll come back to that. And, and Debbie, here's your here's your ten minute warning that we'll probably be coming coming back to that. Um, any further scope questions there? That was thank you, Ben, for that. Okay, um, I think then let's let's move to the more detailed breakdown that um, Nick prepared um, with the proviso that yeah, there's a kind of asterisk around around what other, some other uh, restrictions might be might be there. Um, okay, so um, this was a document that uh, Nick wrote up in consultation with various parties there, including Mr. Active and and um, Active Westminster. Um, we don't have representatives from all of these organizations on the current call, but at least I think we can make some useful progress here. Um, I will attempt to outline this, but I'm anticipating uh, interruption and welcoming uh, interruptions from, from Nick on this point. Um, so um, if we go down to requirements, um, allow a customer to use a broker to make bookings on their customer account um, to ensure they can make use of their existing memberships. Um, so this, this refers to something that we already slightly covered uh, earlier with, with that, that mapping where you've got a broker, which would be, for instance, the MCR Active app um, that allows people to log into that and make use of their existing memberships in leisure centers already participating in the scheme. Um, so the requirement for their, uh, including both pay-as-you-go and pay-monthly memberships, so whatever their affiliation, um, that's covered. And who, are, who have we been joined by? Oh, hi, welcome, Issy. Uh, we're just going through um, requirements, uh, requirements document that Nick Evans of Iman has prepared um, to make sure that um, we're just uh, going to get everything covered off that we need to with the memberships proposal right now. Brilliant. Thanks, Timothy. Um, so scenarios here. Um, a local authority wants to have a one-stop shop for opportunities in their region. Um, yeah, that seems that seems to be kind of the, the raison d'etre of uh, MCR Active and Active Westminster, and a very ambitious scope for, for what that would cover, but um, including parks, I've just learned. Um, however, certainly leisure centers would be yeah, the obvious first place to, to unify that information. Um, that would be supporting a discovery platform. Um, and the Possibly it would, if it logged that a user kept on returning to the same kind of activity or to the same organization, uh, this would be a prompt for, for them to actually take out a membership with that organization um, or could conceivably be used by say a motivational fitness app that, that would allow them an easy booking flow. Um, is anybody on the call um, surprised by this? Does this seem like a, a widely shared requirement? Is this uh, a foundation or are there wrinkles that need to be uh, considered here? I feel, I feel like I'm looking at people working through implications of things in their heads. <laughs>
We can give a call out to, uh, to uh, B was uh, from, just in terms of sources, the last, the last call on the subject um, uh, from Playfinder, uh, the idea that, that an, an organization might want to work with an operator to uh, allow people to make bookings via their membership. Um, the example with Playfinder uh, was um, that, for example, a lot of people use Playfinder for pay, pay as you go bookings, um, pay and play. It might be that someone through doing that decides to get a membership with, for example, everyone active, uh, and then wants to continue to make bookings through Playfinder. So the idea is that that allows kind of an upsell journey um, from Playfinder through to the kind of memberships of, of the operators. And then, um, th th so the same thing that MCR Active's using here could also be used for that scenario, which is obviously totally separate to a local authority scenario. Um, part of the power, obviously, of these, these uh, specifications is to try and capture more than just the narrow use case so that it allows for wider and broader innovation. Uh, that being said, more conservatively, I guess, uh, given that it takes time to think these things through, um, what alarm bells are ringing for people? Is anybody looking at this thinking, I don't see how that would work, or my current system wouldn't support this? Yeah, I think it, I mean, from a Gladstone perspective, I don't think we've been um, shy at kind of sharing some of the concerns with regards to the overarching scope. <laughs> and every, you know, every call, there seems to be different things added to it. And so in all honesty, that's, that's our real concern and has been since the start is that this ultimately becomes unachievable because it expands so much that we, we don't get to a point where we're able to deliver anything. It's, I mean, it's, it's software, everything's possible, but everything also has a cost and requires people's time in, in developing it. And I think the, yeah, I don't think we've at any stage throughout this got comfortable that the level of effort that we're looking at will provide the level of, you know, returns that people are looking for. And I, I think our, our intention or our, what we've been looking to see throughout this is just to, to kind of just to break it down, to break it down into smaller components so that we can actually get it out there and, and get it into people's hands and start using it and start to see what some of the value is. So yeah, we're, you know, as we have been since the start, broadly, incredibly supportive of this initiative and looking to open up data, but doing it in a way that's achievable and actually starts making a difference for some of the organizations that are involved. Right, okay. So headline, it's fine, but the details need to be unpacked and the scope needs to be stabilized i guess well and just managed yeah i think it goes back to ben's initial point of being you know as clear on what is going to be excluded at least in these mm -hmm. early steps as what is included because i think that's i think that's also one of the you know the gaps that's kind of crept in as as we've as we've gone on and one of the contributing factors to why we've seen so much scope creep okay yeah um Okay, that's useful. I mean, that's part of the reason for having this call. Really, is just yeah. Let's <laughs> let's be very clear about about the requirements. I would anticipate that there will be a sort of review phase after this call. That this document that that you're seeing on your screen or you were seeing on your screen is going to need comment and then refinement, and then we can deliver a yeah a checklist, a recipe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ben, you've got your hand up. Oh, I think you're still muted, Ben. Yeah, that was going to happen at some point. Um, yeah, agreeing with Claire. Um, I just, um, I guess, that definition of a uh, membership's included here or not, and it seems like we delved immediately into memberships on uh, in the first point, and it goes back to it, it, it's 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 just massive for us as an organisation to manage, and and we're going to have to do one hell of a lot of. We've either got to have some, some very and there's some amazing tools that I don't understand behind it, or we're going to have to um, we're really going to have to simplify how how we do it if we're going to try and do yeah too much. I I think we've got to say what what's step one on this on this journey and let's get that one delivered. I think if we're trying to do steps five and six, we're we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're not going to get to step one. Okay, well then, uh, <laughs> throws the rest of the agenda out. But okay, let's let's go through the additional points then on the requirements. Um, if there's a clear sort of no go, we can't do that. That's a useful data point. Um, uh, sorry, Tim, is it worth? Um, I'm not sure if this is um, 
uh, so there are people in this call that have different parts of the journey of, of thinking about this. Um, I, I, I should say that um, my role in, in, in putting the documents together and things like that, I, it's just been trying to reach, as people are saying, the kind of lowest possible uh, amount of work that has been needed to do this. Believe it or not, I actually pushed back on this document even existing for 18 months um, because of the reasons that Claire and Ben have both um, very clearly, clearly outlined. But we don't need any more scope. Let's just get the thing done. Um, the document has arisen because of a, a constant pushback that without this feature in there, at least in a minimal form, um, that this just wasn't going to be viable. I know that um, David's not here to uh, kind of give his view on that. Um, but I think that David from Everyone Active very clearly made that point and actually was one of the key drivers behind this document in the first place, because um, from his perspective, this was a kind of essential uh, part of it. Um, and uh, obviously it's uh, yeah, to try and do, do that justice without him kind of explaining why that would be from, from his perspective. Um, it was about, um, obviously the, the default with Open Active is to treat everyone as a guest, guest booking, which I think works for a lot of scenarios. And there's a, um, I know that's something that is, is a very simple path. Uh, it's a very useful path for a number of use cases. Um, but there's also, with the membership scheme, there's an additional consideration that by making everyone a guest who's involved in the membership scheme, we're actually converting a significant number of people in the database at the moment um, into guests, um, because obviously the MCR Active membership scheme is a kind of core part of the, the makeup of the customer base of a... Uh, so I, think, I, I think we're kind of going into details and the problems of alternative solutions. And I think... I think that's fine. I think we do have to have that conversation. I don't think we need to have that conversation now. Like right. I, think, I, think, I think it's important just to get the, get the requirements laid out. Um, and then we can have a conversation maybe in a subsequent call about which requirements are just impossible to support. If there's a conversation to be had about which ones are absolutely, if we've got one group of people, I think predictably saying impossible or very difficult and another group saying absolutely necessary and required, you know, that conversation has to happen. But I think we need to have it at that kind of high level before we, we go into yeah. questions of why particular solutions may not be viable. Um, I realize that a lot of that exploratory work has been done um, with, with other organizations, but I think we need to just keep it high level for the moment. Because um, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I'll, I'll restate Nick's point in another way. I don't think anything on here is idle. You know, I don't, it hasn't been a, <laughs> hasn't been a question of a, it, this is not at this point a wish list um, of anything that could conceivably be supported. These are all, you know, well scoped, but we need to make sure everybody's aligned that these are requirements and that they are supportable. Um, so two is a follow on from one, um, which is um, that, that, uh, that a barcode can be issued basically. Um, that will allow any participating organization uh, to admit people uh, to their premises. Um, any any alarm bells there, or or does that, are things basically subsumed under the the earlier point that this is a large project and scoping is is a concern? Are there anything is there anything specifically worrying or difficult about that leaping out to people? Do we actually have like a clear idea of who the target audience that we're, I, I know it's kind of broad that it's everybody, but have we actually nailed down to who, who we're most looking at this going towards? Because obviously technology and different approaches would be for different types of people. I just wonder whether we've kind of broken that down rather than just going straight for a solution. Uh, but I don't think I understand the, Question. Sorry, when you say this, do you mean this document or do you mean the sort of the general approach? So, so the, the audience that we're looking that are going to be using this functionality, have we actually broken down who those, who the actual target audience is going to be? I, I know we've got kind of Manchester as a whole, everybody, all the residents, but not everybody's going to be persona. using that. So I'm going to look at Alice, actually. I, I think probably Alice has got the best insight into that. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. So um, one of the key objectives of MCR Active is um, to help people who are currently inactive to get active. And part of their kind of big offer or their big offer in, in that space is around this kind of one-stop shop so I guess you know the research that actually I think was led by Sport England around well 
people want to get active but they don't know how to they don't know where they can get active we need to make sure that it's as easy as possible for them to find out where they can play tennis or do boot camp in the park or whatever it might be um part of that kind of approach is what this website in manchester is, is trying to achieve it's all around making it as easy as possible to find out um where and how to get active and book onto those activities so that's certainly one of their kind of target uh, markets i think that said you know there's an awareness in the city that there are those that are digitally excluded and there's a lot of work going on offline around sort of engaging with those groups um but then it is also just the sort of leisure offer in the city so you have this kind of inactive population but more broadly they they want mcr to be the brand um, that people identify with around sport and physical activity in the city so it is this kind of broader resident offer as well um, that they're um that they're kind of um you know seeking to engage with every every member of, of um you know everybody that lives in manchester but inactivity is kind of a big target um, for them. Okay. Okay. Thank, thanks, Alice. Um, does that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, I, th I, th I think so. It's just trying to think because I think a lot of the people on this call are used to memberships being kind of the the life and soul of the systems that we're providing, and those people use that that they've got their they're aware of their brands that they use already. They're aware of that facility. So it's just how we looking to extend that and what is the overarching goal of you know is it to get more people active that aren't members or is it to get the people that are active oh, already in Manchester we're we looking to get them more active and it's kind of what, what are we looking to achieve to actually work out what how we get there yeah I mean I would say it's, it's both yeah you know, it's definitely it's both of those um there's a sort of a um, residents will have incentives book for signing up to become MCR active members and they'll get discounts on um, pay and play um, activities in the city and leisure centres but also through community partners so those might be people that are already you know doing lots of sport and, and physical activity in the city that are incentivized um, to carry on doing that and do that more and then there will be these kind of, I guess, more targeted interventions, if you like, for inactive community yeah. populations. And that's where they'll be using the data and insight that they're getting back from, you know, the likes of us at Full Global to understand, well, kind of what's working in those communities, what, where, where are the gaps, what could we do more of? So there'll be some more targeted work as well around engaging with those populations. Hopefully that's a better answer. Yep, thank you. Um, so can, can I just add in to support that, Alice, and this might help you understand as well, Andrew, that uh, one thing it's not is a replacement for GLL's commercial membership proposition in Manchester. So therefore, we can going to continue selling our memberships as we had previously, with the exception of the pay and play memberships, which will be driven towards the MCR activity finder portal, um, where customers can then take out a pay and play membership they're just casual engagers in sport and then they can share that data with GLL if they wish if they would then wish to use the GLL leisure center so that's maybe just help clarify perfect thank you okay uh, yeah thank you uh Stephen and Alice I think that yeah clarified the the purpose really uh the end point um Uh, so yeah, that's um, sort of raison d'etre. Um, point three, allowing a customer to join a membership scheme providing, for instance, free swimming across a number of sellers and then walk into that seller's venue and be recognized by the entry system. So that's, yeah, combining the um, access requirement, I suppose, with the data munging requirement, data combination requirement. Um, does that still seem consistent to everyone with the with the previous requirements nothing to hmm? um does it need to be specific around um the types of memberships that would be applying to individuals via this solution in in that um in that document because um clearly 
as was just alluded to, we wouldn't be putting on direct debit memberships or anything like that as part of this process. It is just localised memberships that offer those discounts. And there also needs to be, I guess, a, a clause in there or some description in there that's related to whether that uh, membership um, is, is it a cost or not and how the costs would be handled because um, there's, there's a lot of cases where um, uh, councils offer a discount but it's a, an annual fee or something like that they're not always free um, so there needs to be a case of dealing with the, the fees that are due as part of those memberships being applied as well as the ones that are applied with no fee if that makes sense. Right okay I, yeah I think I think that aspect of it is is out of scope, but I think it's worth noting that explicitly as, as out of scope that how you, yeah, how you get to that point of having a particular membership category isn't something that's canvassed for in the document. But yeah, we can we can add a note saying <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely the the exceptions or, or saying this is not what it does <laughs> um, is as right. yeah. important as saying what it does do. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we will indeed come on to that uh, a little lower in the document. Okay. Can I also just mention that not everybody's probably got the ability to take a QR code? Sorry, not a QR code, uh, but I don't, I don't know what the method of entry is. It's going to differ from site to site about what their method of entry is. So there does need to be a thought process about, I think it's the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, but, but there are going to be plenty of places that well, aren't you? You're not going to be able to get into a facility as a result of one method. Okay. Right. Um, so so um, for somebody who's not familiar with what those other entry methods would be, uh, what are the other candidates on the table there? Steps probably better than me. <laughs> um, my understanding, it's all down to the type of card reader that you've got or right. um, uh, um, device reader that you've got on your turnstile. Some will read um, multiples of different types of barcode, QR code, etc. and some will not. Um, and we've quite quickly realised that a lot of the ones that we've got installed on our turnstiles will not read uh, mobile devices very well, for example. Um, so publishing a QR code or a barcode on a mobile device and expecting those to work isn't always um, as seamless as you, you'd like it to be. Okay. So there's a big, big cost and it's replacing a lot of those scanners um, just to enable mobile devices to be used to gain entry. Right. Um, okay, I think we'll just need to note that as a, I, you know, I suspect there's not much we can do there beyond make another scope note saying, you know, this, this is a limitation of what, what can be delivered digitally. Um, but we can add that to the, as a point of discussion for the requirements document, I suppose. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, did somebody say something? Okay. Um, so allow the broker to determine and assign which concessions are appropriate to each customer as part of their membership scheme, um, i.e. entitlements. So this is the pricing uh, issue that's been alluded to previously. Um, I think we've already covered that in conversation, uh, but does anybody have anything uh, to add there? Beyond the fact that it's fiendishly complicated? I guess there's going to have to be a means to be able to tell who gets a discount and who doesn't. I'm not sure how that works. I mean, we obviously do it through this membership that, that Debbie alluded to. You put something on the system that says they've got this, therefore they get that. So I, I don't know how that's worked through, but yeah. Yeah, that is covered in the proposal, um, but it's, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the details getting unpacked there do ramify quite a bit, yeah. Um, um, facilitate booking at these concession prices, both via walk-in and online, which includes showing concession prices at the browse stage of the broker's online booking journey. Um, so this is reflecting a, a lengthy conversation um, that occurred in previous calls, um, because there's, there's a difficulty in that the um, data publisher, 
uh, this, the booking system publishes really a list of prices really that could be associated with each item that could be booked. And then it's on the broker side to select which one of those is appropriate to know what the, what, you know, what the, what the user is entitled to, and there needs to be some kind of way of determining that price. Um, but of course, when that list is, is originally published, um, it will usually be the case that there is no knowledge about who the actual customer is. So the display price might not be the price that the user is actually entitled to, and in fact would end up paying at the end of the flow. Um, and this is explicitly declaring that it is, it is in scope um, to be displaying that price right at the, at the start. The headline price will be the, the final checkout price. Um, that seems like a um, the, where that conversation landed was that that was in fact a requirement, even though it's not entirely simple to implement that kind of sophistication. I mean, I guess it's just making it clear that that's only ever going to be possible if the user's logged in, in some way or another. Um, it's not going to be possible to identify the individual's price without them being logged in, and them being recognised by the system, and producing the um, um, and considering all the things that go on in the background to say that person's entitled to that discount. Um, you, you won't be able to present the discounted rate up front without knowing the individual or what they're entitled to. Right. So adding a clarifying note, I guess, into the document saying, yeah, <laughs> predicated on, yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're accessing via the broker, I suppose. Um, okay. Um, allow new users to be introduced to the scheme via the broker. So creating uh, new users. Um, I assume that's, <laughs> that's something that everybody would like to see. Um, that potential for for new onboarding. Um, yeah, with the the consideration of um, how it handles records that match that already exist in the database. Oh, sorry. Can you, think... can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't. Um, I'm hoping that other operators would agree that we wouldn't want to go down the route of starting to create duplicate records for an for an individual. Um, there needs to be some sort of method to look up an individual or, or match an individual based on the, in the information that they've provided um, and associate the same record rather than creating multiple of the same user record. Yeah, I feel, I feel like that's actually one of the advantages is that it would, it would implementing this, these features would eliminate that um, Oh, actually, I'm already a member of this uh, somehow, you know, or I'm already entitled to this through a membership that I already have. Yeah, um, creating that information scaffolding to make that possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, maybe just a maybe a slight clarifying note on there to mm -hmm. uh, make that clear. Sure. Can I just double check? Why was the phrase "create yeah. new users" chosen? Was that deliberate users as, as opposed to customers or members? Uh, it wasn't deliberate at all. We could just uh, say customer accounts. That's probably. Oh, okay. 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 Fine. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, okay. Facilitate booking. Oops. Sorry. Am I sharing my screen? No. Um, and then the final requirement listed um, facilitate booking for dependents such as children uh, on one account. Um, yeah, the, the uh, dependent accounts. Um, how does that, do, does that follow logically for everyone on the call? I mean, it'd be nice to have, but we don't even have that within our own software at the moment where you can switch between accounts and things like that. So um, that solution is not readily available from a Gladstone perspective um, yeah. across all of their current um, applications so there is complications and and we've had to we've we've kind of built the solution and Andrew and Claire can jump in at any point and correct me if I'm wrong but we've worked with them to build the solution but it's not working in our environment but there was a lot of considerations that to go in to that to say who out of that group of people could book for that individual could pay for that individual could see that individual's um, bookings just um 
from a GDR or GDPR perspective, I guess you can't fully expose the information about an individual without somebody else's permission, if that makes sense. Um, those that are under 16 or, or that, that are in your group are uh, less risk, I suppose, but any other adults that are in your group, then there is a question around whether somebody should just be allowed to see their bookings and their information without getting their permission. Right, okay. Um, I believe that is, is that covered in the proposal, Nick? I, I know that we've discussed it. Um, yeah, so um, the interesting thing about this area of the proposal is that it's, it is underspecified. And the reason for that is that the, um, I think the, the major systems, as uh, Debbie's already said, uh, that are talking about implementing this haven't yet uh, got the capability. Um, but I think maybe all will soon, or at least at least many will, <laughs> most will soon have that capability in some form. Um, so uh, having this uh, item on here is, I mean, this isn't something that has been specified and, and there's different ways of doing it that have been considered. Um, but if, uh, if this is an opportunity to coalesce around an idea of how this might work um, with the organizations that are already thinking about it or have, have already built those features, um, that, that that could be useful, and certainly something that that obviously, uh, as Emery mentioned, is family booking, and I'm sure Laura would agree, is key to um, to the, the customer experience. So, sorry, is the solution to that surely not just that you have a customer account for the parent that the attendee can change? You would think that would be a simple solution, but within the software we're, just, we're talking about, that, that turns out to be. Uh, booking on behalf from one account on behalf of another turns out to be a complicated issue within the software. But I think that's the solution. That's something that is being worked on. If that's what you're, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. This this suggests to me that this might be a separate proposal. Then um, that that maybe this needs to be hived off. If there's already discussions underway and the complexity is large, um, I think we need to clarify. Yeah, how much how much this is seen as a hard requirement and whether this is actually something that that enters under separate discussion. Um, because yeah, I think it would <laughs> it would be unfortunate if we have if we try to solve this, I think, and that hinders you know the previous six points getting getting hit. Um, just to yeah, just to just to make clear, I, I anticipate that there's going to be a comment process after this call. Uh, sorry, I should have said this right at the top. The point of this call is not to resolve all of these differences. It's really just to see where everybody is, identify the differences, and then we can follow up with resolving them. You know, in, in asynchronously for the most part. If there's something really horrible that comes up, uh, it can be raised on another call. Um, but yeah, I would I would anticipate resolution being post this call. Um, just a quick, a quick comment for context uh, on the, the dependent stuff. It, it does have an implication on the design potentially. So that might be why it's worth keeping in mind. That's all, but without solving the whole thing, just, you know, so the doors open if you like. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. So there's a, co there's a co-implication potentially. Um, of seven with everything else, okay. Um, moving on to things that are, are deliberately out of scope. Um, not attempting to solve broker-based direct debit or brokering of new memberships. Um, so yeah, this would be the uh, scenario where I suppose you said, you know, I've, I've booked three of these uh, with the same organization. I'd like to get a membership now, you know, say GLL or whatever, um, and, then, and then paying for that. So the current envisaged uh, flow would be once you've made that decision, maybe you're provided with a link into the um, membership flow of the providing system, um, but it wouldn't be something that needs to be supported by the specification itself. That's handled already by, by internal systems. Um, any thoughts or comments there? I feel like out of scope is always easier to agree on than, than in scope. Um, um, not facilitating management of the entire operator account. Um, so yeah, this means that the scope is limited. If you've, if you've booked through the MCR Active app, 
uh, and you want to change something that you've booked in the MCR Active app, you can do that. If, however, you've booked the, if you booked through another channel, as a, you've gone through, say, the booking systems website and made an alteration there, you can't change that through the um, MCR Active app. You have to go through the original channel that you, through which you booked. Um, in theory, it would be possible to hoover up all of the all of the information in the booking system into the app, but that's been declared out of scope. Does that seem like a sensible uh, restriction? Okay. I think we need to clearly define what those changes are. I don't know whether that does it's done at a lower a lower level in the document or not, but um, whether that involves moving, cancelling, changing. Mm -hmm. um, changing the number of uh, participants, et cetera, those sorts of things. I think they need to be listed and said whether they're in scope or out of scope as part of this as well. Um, I mean, some of our online solutions, our own online solutions don't allow move and cancel for everything. And therefore I wouldn't expect us to be able to cater for everything in this solution either. Oh, okay. So, um... So, so sorry, just to be clear, so it could be the case that if somebody made a reservation using the existing application, it wouldn't necessarily be the case that you could cancel through that same app, um, application. Yeah, um, there's still cases that where they have to contact us to make those changes. So, for example, re on, uh, refunds, um, if you were trying to cancel an activity that had been paid for, uh, there's no online refund method for that activity therefore okay. they can't do that online and I, I don't know how anybody else feels about that but I wouldn't want to oh, I'm not sure we could go with having more functionality in this solution than our own solutions yeah I mean it, it can be the case the, the minimal restriction there would that this would be optional functionality that it would be you know we would specify how it would work if that functionality were supported, but you could be open active compliant without having that functionality. That would be one way of dealing with it. And then another would be to say, cancellation is out of scope entirely. Um, we can hash that out further after the call, I think in, in um, comments on the document and so on and so forth, or in subsequent calls. Um, my feeling is that probably optionality makes sense, that this is functionality that would ideally be supported, but not necessarily. Um, I suppose that creates problems if you can cancel some things and not others. That could be a confusing user experience. So we do need. I guess to potentially, that. Debbie, have you got different um, cancellation fees as well, depending when it's cancelled and we'll if it's yeah. refilled? Yeah, depending on the type of activity. Yes, yeah, cert most certainly. If something's free and included in your membership i.e. a group exercise class and you cancel um, within four hours of that taking place and the space is not relet, then we would we would um, charge that customer for the late cancellation. And so all of those things that needed to be taken into consideration when you're advising the customer on what they can cancel, what they can't cancel, and what are the implications of cancelling or moving an activity, um, which can become quite complex and there be a lot of them <laughs> um, so you need to be able to explain to the customer if if the if as an operator we opted out of cancellation and moving on open active then um, we'd need to be able to tell the customer how to cancel if they mm -hmm. can't do it online um, so there needs to be a method for that I believe right yes alternative provision yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay interesting point um, okay thank you noted um, Hopping over again. Um, oh, uh, hold on. Um, no, uh, declared out of scope, not attempting to provide accurate pricing for all members at the browse stage, only pricing for a small rationalized subset of discount entitlements are supported, um, expected to cater for a large percentage of pay and play members. Um, so this seems to be um, slightly in tension with point five of the requirements. So this is really a limitation on five, I guess, Nick, is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly that. The difference between uh, all memberships being pricing available. And this is basically to, I think Debbie's earlier point, 
Um, but the idea of displaying specific pricing for all members is, is, is just not, I don't think, technically feasible, um, at least not within the architecture that we have uh, in, the, in the current specifications. Um, so it's not about trying to uh, ensure that you can have exactly accurate pricing for every member. Um, however, having accurate pricing for the 12 different discount levels that are in MCR, for example, or however many there are in Westminster, um, is, is feasible and uh, that's what the proposal is to have in scope. Okay. Um, I feel what's needed here is probably more information about what the distribution of that looks like. Um, that, you know, are we talking about 50, 60, 90% of members are catered for well at the browse stage? Um, and I, I think it, it's probably worth saying that the, it's, it's all pay and play members mm -hmm. that will be catered for at the browse stage. And I think that the anticipation here is that most people that are pay and play will probably come through this, this channel because that's where they receive the discount. Most people who are, not all, but most people who are monthly, pay monthly members will go through the operators channels directly because they have that relationship with the operator and they use the apps and things like that. So we're not anticipating, just because of the design of the, these things, it's, it's not likely that you're gonna have lots of people using an open active channel if they're a member of something in general. Right, okay. Um... Sorry, by member, I mean direct debit member, not entitlements, which is- the... Right, okay. Uh, but this is, this is kind of a, this is, this is sort of an assumption. Um... Right. Uh, has, is, is this a, how well has this assumption been investigated? Does anyone on the call who's an operator have a view on how many people are going to use MCR Active Active Westminster of their customers? I think Steve is laughing. Maybe Steve has a view. It's, it's all prepaid members, Nick, not just direct debit. Um, but uh, we, as Nick pointed out, we, 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 we're expecting the relationship between any prepaid member to be between the member and GNL not necessarily the member and MSR Active. Although, of course, there'll be plenty of signposting to the MSR Active activity fund if GLL prepaid members are looking to book outside of a GLL location. So, of course, we're supporting that um, wholeheartedly, but uh, that's not the key focus. So oh, okay. um, we, we don't know, um, but that's what we anticipate. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. Um... Yeah, I mean, if <laughs> if the if the if the leisure service providers are happy with that um, um, perspective on it, uh, that makes sense. Um, I suppose, yeah, it's possible to imagine user flows where that doesn't happen. But if that's seen as a marginal case, then uh, then it's a marginal case. Um, does anyone else have uh, proposals for further? Uh, declarations out of scope. What are some further things that um, are worth explicitly noting as not being addressed by the by this proposal? I mean, I think it goes back to the pricing thing, but um, for example, ignoring customer credit and things like that. Um, I think that should be explicitly written down. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have uh, further views there? I think the only thing, going back to my very first point, is in terms of those variations of what you're offering. I mean, anything outside of a, a basic discount just becomes immensely difficult, um, you know, and, and confusing, you know. Um, so I just think that almost it's, it might be worth saying what's excluded out of this, because I can see multitude of members and, and weird and wonderfuls wanting to be implementing this and maybe if you're not explicit about this is the only thing we're talking about nothing beyond that you're going to start to get those kind of things thrown in at some point okay so maybe just unpacking the the out of scope even more explicitly right yeah i think i think the, yeah, the difficulty with writing the out of scope thing is yeah of course it could be in theory infinitely long um <laughs> infinity minus seven um uh, and of course, the context for what gets declared out of scope is things that were considered that were then discarded. Uh, but yeah, we can certainly look at increasing that list to make sure it's crystal clear to a newbie to the system what it is that we're talking about. Yeah. 
was uh, part of the document um does it does it talk any further about um the member the user creation or member creation or is that further on in this discussion um do you mean so yeah the membership you mean for instance an mcr active membership the umbrella membership or do you mean the um leisure center membership so there was a point made as part of the requirements that new users would be able to be created um and those new users if we want to call them users or customers or, or whatever um would need to be assigned a specific membership to get a specific discount and it is that is that further down in the document? If it's not, then there probably needs to be something detailed in there around um, the allocation of subscriptions, as we call them, to a member's record to get the relevant discount for that area or that district or region. Yeah, it does. It does appear in the user flow, but it's in a very it's it's at a very high level. Uh, Low chart customer account exists no customer details capture um, and then and then what happens there so it's quite a schematic kind of view um, yeah. so yeah we can unpack that a bit yeah there's no mention of a membership having to be allocated at that point to receive discounts that an individual is entitled to so with MCR for example there's a whole scheme within that area um, which says if you fit into this category, you get this things for this price. If you fit into this category, you get, get things for this price. And that can own those pricing can only be determined by a subscription being allocated, which we've had discussions with with Nick about. And sometimes that's multiple subscriptions that need to be allocated. Um, so the in scope and out scope elements of member creation and subscriptions needs to be included in this. Um, and operators that read it need to understand that um well brokers i suppose those subscriptions are going to be specific to every every client or every um uh, offering that's happening mm -hmm. they're not they're never going to be the same right so, so the mechanism will have mapping to be... process right okay so the mechanism will have to be very adaptable um and, and yeah. open-ended yeah okay mm -hmm. um yeah, I suspect that one will bear further discussion. Um, is it certainly in principle possible to design a, a system that will accommodate that? Um, certainly from a specification level, it's easy because you say, oh, here are some slots that information would fit into, but how implementable that is is a different question. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, so in terms of, we've got, we've got 10 minutes. Um, in terms of moving forward with this, uh, the action on me is to update the document with the various comments that have been made so far. Um, that is to say the, the requirements document. Um, and um, I then to circulate that with all of you, well, it'll be a public circulation, but I'll, I'll ping you all specifically about it uh, to make sure that your concerns can be voiced and represented in relation to it. Um, and then we move towards some kind of resolution. Um, hopefully we can just do all this asynchronously and coalesce around the document. Uh, it could be that we need to follow up with specific calls in this forum. Uh, but at any rate, I will uh, look after the, the secretarial functions and get something out to everyone by the end of the week. Um, that's my initial thought. Um, but we do have nine minutes left now. So if there's any other business that people want to bring forward or any questions people have, uh, let's uh, air them now, please. Is there anything in the documentation about um, the authentication of users? It's probably worth me saying, uh, Debbie, at this point, uh, that the documentation that this is the high level requirements document. And there's a document that sits underneath this, which is something like 40 pages long, that includes much of the stuff that we've previously discussed and um, that some folks on this will already be more intimately aware of uh, because uh, of, um, of those kind of uh, other conversations. And so, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. It's uh, the intention of the requirements document wasn't to capture all of that detail. It was uh, kind of trying to capture the more high level business points. But if there's anything that you think should be taken from the, yes, what well, uh, Tim's showing the kind of broader proposal, which I know that um, Debbie, you've had input on uh, previously. Um, and um, and we've had previous discussions um, with the organisations that are listed in that at the top of the document. Um, so uh, 
yeah so so i guess if uh, i'm not sure the best format uh, tim for this is, is it worth us trying to transfer stuff from one document to the other or how does how do we fit in those kind of observations um well i think frankly there's um there's work to be done on the requirements document obviously from the conversation we've just had so let's try to focus attention on that at the moment however that said um we can add in a link to the broad proposal so that if people have got questions about how you know if they're broadly in agreement with the requirement but they've got doubts about implementation that information is there and they can they can comment there as well it's it's, it's kind of a difficult continuum i can imagine what a question that looks like an implementation question becomes a sort of scope question and vice versa um, so it's worth looking at both documents but in the first instance i think requirements is what we're looking at now Uh, ben, you look like you're you're minded to say something. I am. Um, I'm conscious of the complexity that the membership gives to the the, the booking solution, and um, I don't know uh, the the speed of how we can implement something to encompass the whole solution that we're talking about today, including the membership versus the opportunity to do it in two halves and I don't you know I, you know are we better just going pure non-member booking and then do the membership thing afterwards is that going to give the community a better result quicker than the added complication of the membership stuff which for me is is far more complex and and, and looking at that you know at a later date I'd, but I, I, i'm not you know minded to sort of say well this is going to take you know x long you know if it's only going to take another two 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 minutes then yeah we might as well do it all but i have a feeling it might take quite a lot more to do the membership side i don't know whether that's been discussed or thought of or um ben, ben i feel like i should represent david at this point um because he said do it all at the same time didn't he you did so you go. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. But I, I can tell you the reason for so so. Um, many on this call have already implemented the first half, as you say, the booking spec. I think um, maybe hmm. uh, Gladstone and Everyone Active might be one of the only ones on the call that haven't, in fact, done that work. Um, so so there are a number of organisations that have done the the first half, and I think um, David's key concern was uh, to do both together. Uh, so that the whole thing is considered uh, uh, in one go and um, do it once, do it right type thing. Um, I, I think we all push back at some point against that and doing the first half. And I think we might have got to a position, but I don't know, with the implementation plan where it might be the first half first, kind of while we're figuring this out. So we don't block everything on this bit because this membership stuff is quite independent of, uh, of the booking first bit, which has obviously been implemented um, quite a few times at this point. Uh, so that helps. I guess, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, well, there we go. That's uh, that's that's me and Dave being in total harmony in terms of uh, what we thought. Um, I guess it's um, I guess it's just understanding it once the scopes scopes put it out in terms of whether whether or not that is the case. Ignore me then. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, I don't personally have a comment because it really depends on the system and on the business model that you're that you're running. Um, you know, if, if member if it's hard to disentangle membership from everything else that your system does, then it makes sense to take it at, at a whack. Um, if if that's fairly modular, you know, maybe maybe other options are open to you. But yeah. Uh, any further comments in the last uh, four minutes? Okay, well, if nobody's got anything further to add, um, thank you very much for joining the call. Uh, we normally, normally these are all, only an hour, uh, but uh, it was 90 minutes just because this was uh, inaugural. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking uh, more specifically and, and more in detail as the year progresses. Uh, so thank you very much for a big chunk of time out of your day, and I will be uh, nagging you really by the end of the week to, uh, to contribute further. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah, enjoy your days. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye, Tim. Bye. -bye.